moderator who's going to be introducing the speaker. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to have Andrew Walker Laut, uh, Dr. Andrew Walker Laut, uh, as a moderator today. Uh, he's a nuclear physicist in uh, Berkeley uh, National Labs. He's a uh, um, we have a long history together. Uh, I worked, he was a, a staff member at Jefferson Lab and William and Mary when I was a postdoc there. We co authored uh, one and a half papers, and we have a, 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 an academic lineage. We had the same uh, academic uh, father. And so we've known each other for a long time. And I figured he would be, um, he's the person that put me in touch with the speaker today. And so I figured he would do a great job of introducing the, the speaker. So, Take it away, Andre. Okay, thank you, Raul. I'll just keep this very short. I was very excited to be asked to introduce Fernando today, the speaker. Um, uh, so Fernando Perez started off actually in the same field as Raul and I, which was, I didn't know until I met him in, at Berkeley. And then he, uh, from there transitioned to uh, getting very involved in creating open science software for scientific users ranging from like doing personal computing to high performance computing. So the whole breadth. And if you don't know, he happened to invent IPython, which is a tool I use daily for my research. And he also created the Jupyter Notebooks, which turned into Jupyter Hubs. And so they support all sorts of scientific languages and high performance computing systems. Uh, so anyway, he's a huge promoter of open science, which I really love. I'm a big fan of open science, like meaning dumping all my code and data into the world. And I'll just stop myself there and say I'm very excited to introduce Fernando Perez, who's now a professor at UC Berkeley. Uh, and please take it away. Let me set a little timer. Um, is audio OK? Yes, I can hear. OK, perfect. Well, um, Andrew and Raul, thank you very much for that kind introduction and the invitation and the opportunity to speak. Uh, let me set up screen sharing real quick here. Um, this ought to be the right window and let's make sure that we get sound and video all okay. Uh, what? Okay, uh, never mind. Zoom decided that it wanted me to install. Um, okay, um, can people... Um, can I get a quick uh, thumbs up on whether audio is okay? Zoom Zoom popped up an error message. Sorry, we can still hear you. I was trying. Okay, to... all right, all good. Audio and video are all good. Then let's can see your screen. Uh, yes, thank you. Let's proceed then. Uh, zoom through a, a weird message that I had never seen before, and I'm not going to debug that right now. <laughs> um, so thank you again both for the kind introduction and the opportunity to speak to, to, the, to the participants um, at this event. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna trace a little bit of what this odd path that Andrew, uh, that Andre uh, was, uh, was uh, kindly describing about how I got to, to where I am, uh, starting in Colombia. So I was uh, born and raised uh, in, in Colombia, more specifically in Medellin. Uh, Medellin is a city uh, nestled hop high up in the mountains, kind of a right, right around the elevation of Denver, Colorado. Uh, obviously much warmer since it's in the, in the tropics. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful modern cosmopolitan city. I love it, I miss it. Um, unfortunately, it's also the source of great violence. Uh, those of you who may have seen um, the, the series Narcos on Netflix, um, it's actually not that far from reality, that even though obviously it's fictionalized for TV, um, it depicts a lot of the, the violence associated with the drug trade that was pervasive in the 1980s where I grew up. Um, the scene where the, the cartel leader Pablo Escobar is killed uh, was actually, that actually happened uh, 10 minutes from my house when I was studying physics, uh, doing my undergrad in physics, uh, kind of on my way to doing QCD as Andre uh, mentioned later um, in the US. And part of the reason why I had to leave Colombia was really that sense of pervasive violence everywhere and that you could die in the midst um, of this kind of violence at any point in time made it really hard to think about science and physics and computing, which were the things that I was interested in. So I, I've had an interest in the intersection of physics and computing since those days of undergrad. So while this was happening around me, um, these are some screenshots of the kind of work that I was doing um, as an undergraduate uh, in this particular case was uh, designing numerical methods for solving the three body problem, but the, the electrostatic three body problem, not the gravity gravitational three-body problem. Um, turns out that there's some interesting numerical issues that you have to deal with uh, to handle those collisions uh, correctly, the, the collisions that can happen 
in, in, in two and three body systems. And, uh, and for that work, what I started using was uh, a combination of analytical and numerical techniques um, that kind of married multiple tools. And I started using Maple, uh, uh, which is a system that um, isn't as popular today as it used to be, but it's kind of in the spirit of Mathematica, but I was a more heavy Maple user at the time, deriving the analytical equations needed, then converting them in Maple to C code, and then in inserting that auto-generated code from the analytical structure into C++ programs that were then compiled to run uh, to do numerics and making plot figures with GNU plot at the time. Uh, we're talking 1993, 1994. Uh, we didn't have the modern machinery, but this was kind of the spirit of the problems that I was interested in. Um, and actually, right before coming to do a grad to, for grad school to the US, I um, had to teach a course on introductory computational physics for undergrads at my at my institution in Medellin. Um, and I did not want to use tools like Maple or IDL or Mathematica or MATLAB to teach it because in Colombia, access to those tools is very expensive. Um, and I actually had a copy of Maple that I was using for my undergrad, but we didn't. I couldn't rely on those expensive proprietary tools uh, to teach computational physics to undergrads. Um, so what we did was we put together this really rickety system uh, where we installed Linux in 94, this was really an exercise in duct tape and bubblegum wrappers, uh, but we installed Linux on a VAX, on, I'm sorry, on a 486 computer, something much slower than any of the phones you have in your pocket today, um, on a 486 computer, and then using VAX terminals from a mini computer that the physics department had mostly mothballed, um, uh, kind of a relic from the, from the 80s. Um, we used those terminals to log into this Linux machine, and I could teach a group of about 15 students trying to do computational physics. Um, unfortunately, that was a disaster. Um, the complexities of Unix and GNU plot and C code by hand without easy access to the high level mathematics and visualization and turned that course into a nightmare um, where probably I believe one student fared okay, somebody who actually had a lot of computing experience and the rest mostly drowned in a thicket of error messages about compilers and pointers and basically tool chain issues. And I remember promising to myself, I will never teach again something like this unless we have better tools so that we can focus on the ideas. We can focus on the science. We can focus on thinking about physics and computing rather than the low level mechanics uh, of sort of systems management. Um, and I left at the time uh, to go to Colorado. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, um, I did a PhD in the same fields that both Andrew and, and Raul uh, with much less uh, sort of academic impact in that particular discipline. Um, I, I quickly exited stage left from QCD. No, uh, no, uh, no hard feelings with the field, but it just wasn't quite for me. Um, and I moved on to doing a postdoc still at CU Boulder in applied mathematics. Um, but I did spend a lot of time in Colorado as is appropriate to anyone uh, in Boulder, uh, procrastinating up in the mountains uh, on the rocks and on the ice kind of around, uh, around Boulder and thinking still about these questions about how to make computing both more closer to the thinking of scientific processes and to the openness of sharing and collaborating with others that I wanted to bring basically back that knowledge to folks uh, like my colleagues and my mentors back in Colombia. And so as it turns out, my PhD didn't go well. Um, as a student, I struggled a lot uh, towards the end uh, of my PhD. Uh, I had a terrible relationship with my first PhD advisor. Uh, I was kindly rescued by a wonderful physicist named Anna Hasenfratz, who offered me kind of a way out. But in the middle of a crisis of a, crisis of a PhD that was not going well, uh, I actually was fired on my fifth year by my first PhD advisor. Not a great career move. Um, if you want to stay in academia, to be fired uh, towards the end of your, your PhD. Um, but in that, in the middle of that crisis of what do I want to do with myself? What do I want to do with science? Um, I started thinking more and more about these issues of access to computing um, and open source and the growing movement of Linux and open source tools for scientific computing. And for me, this was an issue that came from multiple angles. One was uh, an ethical question of access and equity. As I mentioned, the, the tools for science that we used in the US and that I did have access to obviously in Colorado uh, were proprietary and expensive and therefore not accessible to folks like my mentors and colleagues back in Colombia. Um, 
the issue of community and of collaborative community. I got into science because I wanted to learn about nature and discover things about the world with others. But I quickly discovered that a lot of day-to-day -day science was more about competition than about collaboration. And what happened was I found in the open source community, a bunch of scientists who were genuinely interested in sharing their work with one another, not with competing with one another. And that was very refreshing. Um, there was an epistemological angle to this, which is that I didn't believe in the notion that we should understand how nature is put together by using tools that we, are, that we are not allowed to understand. And with proprietary software, unfortunately, you have to sign or click on something that says, you will not try to open the software to understand how it works. And to me, that may be okay for a word processor or, or a video game, but that's not at all okay for a tool that I'm going to use to try to understand how does nature work. I don't think it's consistent with the notion that, that, that science is about sort of prying open the black box of nature, if you want. Um, and finally, technical. I'm a geek, I like computing, and Python seemed like a really good tool um, to sort of connect back to those, uh, those struggles I had had a few years earlier teaching in Columbia with uh, with more with a more antiquated stack. Um, and so for an afternoon, I scurried away and wrote this bit of code that actually still has my email address as fperez at pi0.colorado.edu. Pi0 was the name of the of the server, and it refers to to one of the one of the pions, one of the, one of the kind of fundamental particles in the in the in the standard model. And um, that was the name of the of the email server in Colorado. This was the first iteration of IPython um, that actually recognizes right off the bat that is it, it's inspired by systems like Mathematica. It was a system to give you the environment to run bits of code look at figures, look at your data files, and explore computing interactively. It turns out that the heart of scientific computing is not about writing software for a fixed set of requirements, but it's in using the computer as a tool to think, as a tool to explore, as a tool to operate on your data and gradually build not only an understanding, but build the questions that you want to ask next. And that is very different from software engineering in an industrial setting. But I want to highlight that from the very beginning, this little bit of IPython that I wrote in an afternoon, and it's been now sort of 20 years of work, um, uh, rapidly I joined forces with two other folks, Janko Hauser, an oceanographer in Germany, and Nathan Gray, uh, a grad student at the time at Caltech, who had written also similar tools for interactive Python work. I merged them together, and a couple of months later, I released the very first version of the actual IPython. This was in December of 2001. Um, by merging my work and the work of Nathan and, and Yanko, and I want to highlight that because this theme of collaboration go, runs through everything. And I wouldn't be where I am today if I hadn't found from the very beginning a community of people who said, look, maybe I'm too busy today to work with you on this. That's what both Yanko and Nathan said. I'm too busy to work on IPython right now, but take my code, do what you want with it. And what I did was I merged their three, uh, our, my, my original IPython code with what they had done and kind of bundled together and, and started developing what became the publicly known IPython. This was announced um, as the first public release version 2.0.2. This was more like, I don't know, five or 6,000 lines of code, not a couple of hundred. Um, and interestingly, if I look at that email, which you can find online, it's available uh, still on the archives of this HiPy mailing list. Um, Many of the core features that I listed there are actually still there. It's kind of interesting to revisit 20 years later that email and realize that today IPython and Jupyter still have at their heart kind of a lot of what was there on day one um, is still there. Um, and this is where the cy this cycle began that I found so uh, so invaluable uh, for me, which was that other people at the time, Travis Sullivan in February of 2002 said, hey, Let's start using uh, this IPython thing in the SciPy community. Now, Travis, for those of you uh, who don't know him, is one of the most influential figures in the scientific Python world. He was the creator of NumPy, the core layer for numerical processing in Python, co-founder of Anaconda, one of the large companies in the scientific Python ecosystem, and uh, now of Quantsite, a new company in that space. Um, and Travis, at the time, was a postdoc building the early versions of the numerical and scientific Python stack. Um, and when Travis said that, and Yanko actually pitched in the mailing list and said, hey, I'm kind of biased, but yes, let's go with IPython. Um, to me, that was hugely rewarding because what I found was, first of all, that I was good for something, right? Uh, my, my boss might have decided that I wasn't good for QCD, but these other scientists said, hey, this, this work you're doing is valuable and we value it and we want it and we're interested in collaborating with you and you're welcome 
to be part of our community and you're welcome to work with us in this community to build something important. Um, this is a quote uh, from Brett Cannon, one of the core Python developers who works at Microsoft and is kind of one of the heads of the Python language development community. Um, and But I remember thinking that quote captured exactly how I felt in that I was driven by at, at first by an interest in using Python for basically for babysitting my QCD simulations. That led to IPython, but it was really finding this community, um, in my case, in the scientific world, for Brett, it was kind of the bigger Python um, community that made it stick and that made me want to continue working uh, working on this. Um, a few years later, I joined forces um, originally with uh, with Brian Granger, who was also a physicist, also at CU Boulder, um, and Min Reagan Kelly, who was also a physics student, originally a student of Brian's uh, in Santa Clara here in California, and then went on to do his PhD, incidentally, at Berkeley, uh, though we rejoined at Berkeley by, by sheer coincidence. Uh, but in 2012, uh, we already had uh, uh, basically a growing team. Um, this was a picture taken at PyCon 2012, where by now the project had had grown quite a bit from, from those early days. Um, whoops, shoot, sorry. That was, uh, I just changed keyboards and my, uh, <laughs> I'm finding that there's a key, there's a couple of keys in a, in a place that I don't expect them. And so unfortunately this, whoa. We're seeing the slide with you and the two guys you're just talking about. Okay. Uh, conference. Here we go. So thank you. I'm sorry about that. I need to be super careful. There's the end key in this keyboard is right next to the arrow key. And this has already happened to me. I just got this keyboard this weekend. Um, and so at PyCon, we already had a bit of a team. Um, and what happened was uh, over time, IPython evolved into something that we called originally the IPython notebook, uh, now uh, the Jupyter notebook. Uh, Brian Granger in 2010 and 2011 put a huge amount of work in developing the first product, the first web prototype after we had multiple failed attempts that, that gave us ideas on what to do and what not to do to build a notebook environment. For those of you who haven't used it, you can think of it as, I'd like to describe it as Google Docs with a brain. It's basically a web client for documents. Uh, and those documents can have equations, they can have text, they can have math, they can have figures but they can also have code and that code is executed and you get the actual results of the code execution, which can include interactive graphical controls. Um, and these documents allow you to, to not only think and document your thinking, but to share your work with others in a reproducible fashion. Um, and so today what has happened was that original seed of IPython has grown into this much larger project that is not only about Python, but where you can do your work in Julia and R in any of about a hundred different programming languages. Um, and it has grown into a large community um, of people that build tools for this kind of interactive, reproducible, exploratory scientific computing. Um, the Jupyter Notebook remains at the heart of it, but there's other tools that I'm gonna mention like Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Hub that allow you to work in larger teams, to deploy your work not just on your laptop, but say on a supercomputing facility and to do work much more com and to build more complex workflows and interfaces for scientific analysis. And again, the theme is all about the community. These are some pictures of students attending JupyterCon and some of the some of the participants and some of the core development team, which is not Brian and myself and Min anymore. Um, it's tens of tens of people with thousands, tens of people kind of working at the heart of the project with thousands more contributing in a, in a distributed open source community. And these are the people who deserve all the credit, not me individually. Um, and importantly, we are part of a bigger ecosystem, right? Jupyter in a sense is a portal for you to use interactively a vast array of tools, some of which are generic, like say scikit-image or scikit-learn uh, or matplotlib that are kind of general tools for image processing or data visualization or machine learning. And some which are quite specific. SunPy is a package for solar physics. Astro Pi is an astronomy package. DiPi is a package for diffusion imaging and brain imaging. It's a very specialized sub, sub area of neuroimaging, but all of these domain specific tools allow people to do science in a collaborative and open fashion on top of this general infrastructure that the community has built. And it's important to kind of recognize the, the interconnectedness of that ecosystem and how that ecosystem feeds from the work of many. Um, but I want to flag that it's the work of many 
regular individuals. The birth of Matplotlib, which is one of the most widely used libraries today, was John Hunter at the time working as a, a peer, uh, as a PhD student and then a postdoc in pediatric neurology at the University of Chicago, was working on analyzing data from children's epilepsy uh, collected after very invasive brain surgery with this tool right here on the slide, which is a highly proprietary tool that I think cost on the order of $10,000 per license. Um, and what he did was he started by building tools to be able to analyze these data in Python and visualize them. Um, and ironically, there was very good 3D visualization software at the time for this, not very good 2D vis software. You think it's the opposite, but at the time, uh, for various reasons that don't matter now, the 2D layer was what was missing. He was coming from a combination of this proprietary tool and MATLAB and decided to build something called Matplotlib. Um, John Hunter sadly passed uh, back in 20, uh, 2012, um, right before sort of really the big explosion and the big success of the open source uh, uh, Python community. He was probably my best friend. Um, and I, I, I dearly miss the fact that someone like him, who was an exceptional leader and character in our community, passed away. Um, but I want to flag how the contributions of individuals who came to this just with the intent of sharing and building with others, even when they were grad students or postdocs, very junior folks in the community had this very large scientific impact. So as an example and an illustration of this impact, um, you may have seen this in the news a few years ago, the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to those who made the first observation or the, to the, those who led a very large team uh, who made the first observation of gravitational waves. Gravitational waves were a prediction of Einstein from back in 1916. The field equations from general relativity uh, from his paper, from the, his 1916 papers predict, it doesn't matter, I'm, this is not a GR class, I'm not I'm going to try to explain these, but basically they predict, they predict that the curvature of space-time is a curvature that space-time can curve and that that curvature can be modified by variations in the distributions of masses and that those variations will ripple in space and time and will travel over space and time at the speed of light. This is what the C to the fourth factor ends up, ends up capturing. Basically what Einstein said was space and time can ripple and those ripples can travel like waves on the surface of a pond, if you will, if you want an analogy, but it's a four dimensional fabric of space time itself where those ripples are traveling. And if say two big things like two black holes slam into one another, they're gonna make a lot of ripples um, in that lake. And in 2015, the LIGO collaboration, which is a phenomenal modern scientific project that built the technology to detect that, published a paper whose first figure is this one. It's probably gonna be one of the most cited papers in the history of physics. And that figure um, was made all with NumPy, with SciPy, with Matplotlib. The color maps there were developed actually at UC Berkeley. All of this was done with the tools that 10, 15 years earlier, we were struggling to create against many who said that we did that it was a waste of our time, it was a waste of our career, no one would fund it. And now in 2015, these publications are being made exactly with these tools. Um, and the team from the LIGO collaboration actually posted, any of you can go to this, this link and you can play in your browser. You can actually run the analysis of these data in a Jupyter notebook through the web without installing anything. And you can see, for example, if you get to this cell and click on it, Let me play that again. That is the sound of two black holes, 1.3 billion light years, away, uh, light years away, shedding, I, if I recall correctly, shedding something, I'm sorry, excuse me. Let me mute that. Um, who are um, uh, shedding, I believe it's something on the order of three solar masses total. They had about 30 solar masses total combined and about three solar masses got shed in the form of pure energy that traveled across space time and this, That rise in frequency, that is what you see here, which is precisely coming from the fact that as the two black holes spiral into one another faster and faster, the frequency of the, of the ripple uh, increases. And this is the trace on the strain gauges in the, LIGO, in the LIGO mirrors that detected this at two different locations, one in Louisiana and one in Washington state. And the fact that anyone can run this analysis with Jupyter in your web browser without installing anything to me is a wonderful example of why this kind of open collaborative science is valuable. Um, a couple of years later, the first image of a black hole was made by a collaboration led by Shep Doleman at Harvard with Katie Bauman at the time at MIT and today at Caltech, leading the imaging team. Um, this is a slide from the very first public presentation about this image that Shep Doleman actually incidentally happened to make. Um, the very first public talk about this was 
was given at Berkeley, and I, I was there in the physics department when, uh, when this was done in April of 2019, and they acknowledged the contribution of these open source tools to their, uh, to their endeavor. So Katie and I had a chance to give a couple of talks in, uh, a few months later um, in Switzerland, and when she gave her talk, she included this analysis of the community of packages who have contributed uh, on GitHub, all of the open source tools whose contributions were necessary for them to build the analysis layers that, that they used in the, in the analysis and reconstruction of these images. It's a beautiful data science project. You can watch her talk here uh, from this link. Um, and our tools, NumPy, SciPy, MATLAB, IPython, Jupyter, et cetera, along many, many more are actually recognized in their, uh, in their efforts. And just a few months ago, we saw a similar example of impact from uh, NASA, where the little helicopter that went up, um, this was an image, this was actually a screenshot from the video of the control room at JPL that I took, and I recognized this image is Matplotlib. So here you have a Matplotlib window that is tracing the height of the drone as it first hovers a little bit off the ground, hovers, 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 then shoots straight up and hovers now high above the ground, and then it comes back to landing. Um, and, uh, and so this was the telemetry being sent by an, a little helicopter that humanity flew on a different planet, thanks to open source, uh, open source software. This is now being adopted widely. So this is a paper that came out recently from colleagues of ours. Uh, some, of, some of them are colleagues of ours from uh, at UC Berkeley, an organization called 2 a to c that we recently founded, um, kind of advocating for how the usage of these tools deployed in the cloud next to the biggest data sets we have on earth is giving us a new opportunity for basically building collaborative open science in the cloud where we can all work together, even if the resources we have immediately are limited. Th these are two examples um, of two scientists uh, uh, who work in climate science, analyzing from either a Raspberry Pi or a mobile phone, analyzing with Jupyter, um, very large scale data. In this case, the CMIP6 data set is a 30 order 30 petabytes data set of climate modeling um, data being analyzed in the cloud through a mobile interface or a $30 Raspberry Pi computer that you can literally buy and put in a little box that's about the size of a phone. Um, but the point is with these tools, we can build open source platforms for doing large scale science like we never had before. Um, this is an example of a gallery from a project called Pangeo that is mentioned here. And in fact, that both of, both of these forks work on Pangeo that puts together Jupyter uh, alongside with other tools uh, in the open ecosystem, the X-Array and Dask in particular, to analyze large scale um, uh, geoscience data, especially around oceanography, glaciology, and climate change. It's a beautiful, beautiful project. We work closely, uh, closely with this. An example of similar platforms are appearing elsewhere. So this is a um, JEODPP, this weird acronym, is actually the name of a platform from the European Commission, where at their data center, the, the, the big research, uh, research and data center called the JRC, um, which is in Northern Italy, they are developing open source Jupyter-based tools for geospatial analytics uh, with all of the open, um, open data that the European Union releases uh, around this. So it's not only a few of us here in the States, um, it's large, large scale initiatives in Europe, as well as industry. So Microsoft recently announced their Planetary Computer Initiative, which is basically a cloud-based deployment of resources to learn about our changing and, and in-crisis planet and about environmental uh, damage and, uh, and uh, conservation efforts and climate change uh, mitigation. And that platform is a Jupyter Hub deployment. It's basically Jupyter Hub with Dask and the Pangeo stack run by Microsoft and deployed against uh, on the Azure cloud infrastructure against, uh, against their, uh, their data sources. And it's part of their AI for Earth initiative. So this is to show that, um, that we basically have impact across multiple disciplines. Um, by, now I'm gonna go quickly, bioinformatics. These are two examples of other platforms in bioinformatics, so Gene Pattern and Kbase. Uh, Kbase is actually from DOE, from LBL, where Andrew and I both work. Um, and uh, this one, uh, Gene Pattern Notebook, was developed originally at the Broad Institute at MIT and Harvard and is now led by Jill Masarov, who has moved from the Broad to UC San Diego. But these are biologists, right? Not physicists, not climate scientists, but biologists, similarly wanting to collaborate on large scale data sets. 
datasets. Um, it has been used, uh, these tools have been used to make data ab about something as relevant as the COVID pandemic uh, uh, available to the community and for folks to more rapidly access, um, access visualize and make decisions uh, on, uh, on, on, on situations like, uh, like the pandemic. Um, and recently, uh, the Nature Scientific Journal published this little retrospective of scientific computing um, and listed the IPython Jupyter Notebook as one uh, one of the the ten kind of most important contributions uh, of the last uh, of the last decade. Which, as I mentioned, and Andrew was very kind in crediting me, but the credit does not go to me. The credit for for all of this work goes to this community, to folks like Brian and Min and others in the community who have built it uh, as a collaborative effort. Um, we had, uh, for those of you who are interested, there was an, uh, an, an entire issue of computing in science and engineering the, a couple of months ago that was devoted to Jupiter in science, and there's a bunch of articles there um, that you can read if you want to learn a little bit more about, about this. A lot of my uh, motivation today is actually coming from climate change. Uh, you may have noticed that things are not good in our planet. These are not uh, research articles, but just news captions last summer from what's happening with both wildfires and the ice on Earth. Um, and the picture for our planet is a very, very worrying one. Um, so we have a project called Jupiter Meets the Earth, which is funded by the same NSF program that funds the Pangeo project I mentioned already, where a group of us are collaborating by combining um, science-driven use cases in climate data analysis and cryosphere science and hydrology and geophysics, um, together with building the infrastructure of Jupiter to facilitate this kind of these kinds of uh, scientific workflows. And I'm happy here if any of you have interest is, interest in the geosciences in connecting with you. Um, one important element of this is making uh, making it easier to share the actual narratives of science, the actual stories, textbooks, papers, reproducible publications, executable blog posts. Um, one important element in that, in that space is called Jupiter Book. It's a project that was originally led by Chris Holgraf at, at, at UC Berkeley, uh, part of our team. Um, and these are a couple of examples of textbooks, live textbooks, one from Brian Rose at Albany and, and this one from Ryan at Columbia, the, one of the leads of the Pangeo project, precisely that take collections of these notebooks and with one command, turn them into live executable interactive textbooks um, that exist online um, and that can precisely combine narratives with analysis. These are a couple of more examples of these interactive stories. This one from the Earth Lab at CU Boulder and this one from one of our introduction to earth sciences at, uh, at UC Berkeley. Um, and importantly, these textbooks, most of them have links like this one that say, hey, if you go here, you can play with this book without installing anything. So just like that link that I gave you to the, uh, to the LIGO example, the, our textbooks for data science at Berkeley, they look like this. But if a student opens one of these textbooks, the notebooks have a little button up here. And those buttons let them click and without installing anything, they open into, after they give their Berkeley password, they open into a URL that looks something like this, like datahub.berkeley.edu, where they can run the entire text textbook for the class um, at scale without installing absolutely anything um, and with just having a web browser, basically any modern web browser. This makes it possible for us to teach courses like this. So these are some of our data, big data science courses. Data 8 is our undergraduate introductory course. Data 100 is our graduate, is our upper div undergraduate uh, um, principles and techniques of data science that I taught last fall, that this was me a few years ago, and I'll be teaching it again in the spring and the coming fall. These courses have on the order of 12, 13, 1500 students. We could not possibly do tech support and installation management on people's laptops at this scale. It's just not possible. The amount of staffing you would need for that is unthinkable, but we can offer them these courses with something like this. And that is the beauty of open source. It allows us to deploy these classes in a way that is going to impact effectively the entire campus. And today, what we're seeing is these courses have a huge uptake um, at Berkeley. They're the fastest growing courses in the history of the campus. Um, and in a few years, what's going to happen is it's going to be as natural for students to do their analysis in, uh, in notebooks and using tools like Pandas and SciPy uh, and Matplotlib than as it is for them to open their email, um, to just click on, click on Gmail. Um, we are kind of normalizing the notion that these are the modern tools of science. And we're teaching first semester undergrads with the same exact tools that Nobel Prize winning research in physics has conducted, which we think is really, really uh, a phenomenally um, 
uh, transformative uh, process that, we, that we've seen live over the last few years, and that is setting things up for what feels almost like an inversion, uh, an inversion where sometimes the, the undergrads are coming to labs with more modern and fresher and more uh, and more sophisticated computational skills in some areas than even their mentors and the and the faculty and i think that that's wonderful if i have to learn from my undergrads that is a good day uh when my undergrads come to me and they say and they tell me that they have these great tools they've learned about and that i should i should get on with the program um i think that's fantastic um and and this is what we're seeing uh berkeley now runs actually an annual uh, the 2021 edition of this particular workshop i should have updated that slide have uh, concluded, I think about two weeks ago. Um, I, I spoke there, or maybe last week. I don't remember. One or two weeks ago. Uh, but we run now an annual, the, and by we, I mean the collective we, the, the team who runs the data science education program, runs a very comprehensive workshop about how to teach the pe the pedagogy, the infrastructure, the ideas, uh, the many the many considerations that that have to. Uh, be uh, be handled to teach courses like this in a way that's both scientifically interesting, uh, pedagogically well done, ethically um, ethically reflective of of the many issues that arise. Uh, and uh, and that team that team runs uh, runs these workshops now once a year. So twenty five years later, I finally have the stack that I want. Right, I don't have to I don't have to have. Um, this complicated uh, uh, stack that basically loses anyone who isn't already very, very proficient in certain flavors of technicalities that are not really germane to thinking about physics, to thinking about mathematics. Um, they're interesting in their own right, and it's perfectly fair to be interested in that kind of engineering. But when your job is to teach the core ideas of physics, you want to focus on this. This is what I want. I want to give my students an idea. I want to give them mathematics. I want to give them a little bit of code, and I want to discuss what it does. And I want to be I want to be able to do it with as many of them as possible, with as few barriers as possible. And it wasn't possible 25 years ago, but we, we have it today. Uh, now, these tools, for those of you who will end up with careers in industry, are not purely academic tools. I've mostly been talking about science because that's what interests me. But these tools have gained very, very wide industrial adoption. They All of the major tech computing uh, companies today use these tools in one form or another, and there's a, a huge cottage industry of small startups doing uh, doing uh, doing um, this kind of thing. We now have an annual conference, JupyterCon. Uh, we 2019 we didn't have one, but we had one in 2020. Uh, that was that was an online event, uh, and uh, plans for the next edition are are kind of being uh, being formalized as uh, as we speak. Um, obviously, the pandemic has made all of this very very, very hard, um, but we do have a growing uh, a growing online community. Um, and one thing, one point that I want to return to for the last few minutes um, of the presentation before we open it up for questions is this idea of spaces when you're a little bit different. So as I said, I came here to the U.S. as a Colombian immigrant, um, not necessarily finding uh, uh, also the, the, the scientific spaces that I wanted because I had my own struggles and also because I wanted to do all of this open, open work in science back when it wasn't recognize some of my senior mentors flat out told me you need to stop doing this go back to writing physics and math papers that's what that's what you're good at uh, I doubt I'm, I'm any good at it but uh, but uh, but the point their point was what you're doing is not real work um, and I thought it was important hopefully now in retrospective I can show you examples that it has turned out to be valuable um, but at the time we had to create those spaces we had to create the tools uh, in 2012, we found we co-founded several of us co-founded a foundation called NumFocus, um, which serves as a as an umbrella for many open source projects, so that they don't have to go through all of the legalities of becoming a, a nonprofit organization and all of that. And NumFocus has proven to be a wonderful resource that now houses not just IPython or NumPy, but many many other projects, and that has uh, very broad industrial and, and academic support. Um, in 2013, I had a chance of co-founding the Berkeley Institute for Data Science with funding from the, the Moore Foundation and the Sloan Foundation. We created a space where open source was welcome, where open tools and, and open science were very much at the forefront of our mission. And this was a partnership between Berkeley and also um, similar parallel efforts from our colleagues at NYU and UW that have had a big impact, I think, in the in what's what's the modern space of data science was heavily influenced by this effort, which now feels uh, to me it feels like we were writing these grants yesterday, but it's it's close to ten years ago. Um, and more recently, uh, I already flagged a name, but I want to circle back to it. Uh, several of us, including um, Chris Holgraf from Jupiter Book, uh, Ryan Abernathy 
from, uh, from uh, the Pangeo project that I already mentioned, Catherine Carson, who was the lead of the, um, one of the leads of this education program at UC Berkeley in data science. Yuvi, who's one of the engineers who manages uh, our, those, those data science hubs. Jim Colliander, who was the director of the Mathematics Institute at UBC in Columbia, uh, UBC um, University of British Columbia in Canada, who, uh, who has a similar deployment of hubs for Canadian researchers, and Lindsay Hagee, a former postdoc who's now faculty also at UBC, this team put together this organization aimed precisely at doing the things we were doing, whether it was Ryan with Pangeo or Jim uh, in Canada or the rest of us at Berkeley uh, with these programs in, in uh, research and education for doing it at scale for others. So 2A2C is an organization that tries to manage offer managed infrastructure basically as a business, but it's a nonprofit whose only focus is open science and open education and feeding back its own R&D efforts into the support of the open source projects. So we're not a startup. Um, it's a bunch of academics trying to basically offer something that is a little bit different just from our, our jobs at universities to do further development and to be able to offer, for example, if a small college needs to run a hub for a class or for a workshop or for a summer program, they may not have the staffing that we have at a place like Berkeley where we do have a whole division that does this kind of thing, but they may be able to get uh, resources for uh, if, if the right organization existed to do this. And if that organization actually has in its charter to contribute back to this ecosystem, hopefully it'll lead to a more sustainable ecosystem. So to sort of wrap up, uh, if I reflect on my motivations, uh, right, uh, this idea of this ethical idea has become very important to me. The notion that with the, with these approaches, uh, we can provide access to science and education for all, um, and that we should be participants in the process of science. We shouldn't be. We shouldn't think of science as consumers. That's something that bothered me a lot in Colombia. Uh, some some of the technical culture in Colombia was basically engineers and scientists should be people who are educated enough to understand the manual of the of the things you buy from somebody else. And I, I just recoiled at that, at that perspective. Not everyone is like that, obviously, but there was some of that in our culture in Colombia. And I always thought that scientific uh, work was about participating uh, in, your own, in your own right, uh, not, um, not simply being a consumer. And by having tools that we can open and build ourselves and, in, and improve upon ourselves, we become uh, producers and creators as well, and therefore participants. Um, and these other uh, perspectives of the, the collaborative community one, the reproducibility of research one, and the technical things that we can do with Python have, all, have I hope, uh, been now sort of cemented and justified by some of the examples that I've given you. Um, and in closing, I want to touch briefly on the idea of inclusion in science because representation is hugely important. This was an article, uh, oops, that was that was my to stop uh, timer reminder, but I'm two slides away, so I, so I think we're doing good on time for some Q&A. Um, so that representation does matter. This was a great article that came, uh, came out in the New York Times describing uh, Naomi Osaka, who's one of the most remarkable modern tennis players. This was a, a couple of years ago. Um, and in the article, it explained, uh, there, were, there were interviews with Naomi's father who explained how um, he basically was able to build some of the program and the vision for supporting Naomi's talent in tennis by learning from what the Williams sisters had done. And the fact that their father had sort of written down the playbook, if you will, um, of how to support uh, a star like that in a highly competitive sport such as this one. And the presence of those examples of representation was hugely important to lay out uh, kind of a path for uh, in which Naomi could build upon. And, and, and this is very important. But I also wanna flag the fact that as a teenager in Colombia, the examples that I had of, of science were not exactly of other Colombians. Um, all of the science history that I had access to was basically um, old men from Europe, uh, pretty much all of them already dead um, at the time. Um, not all of them because Carl Sagan uh, was a very influential figure for me as a teenager because he depicted science precisely as a history of discovery uh, where everyone was welcome to come in and participate. And that was the example that I was given growing up. The example that I was given growing up by my father, by my, by my mentors in Colombia, was that your own humanity has no, no skin color or no nationality. And that yes, some of those examples might not have been Latin American. There's a lot of issues with equity uh, with countries like ours in this regard. But at the same time, they did drill into me that my ideas were just as valuable and that I could, I could basically rise up 
to working as a peer with others in terms of those ideas. Um, and so we need to work to improve our spaces. We need to work to improve our representation in these spaces, but we also don't need to wait because our ideas themselves have intrinsic value um, that hopefully with these, uh, within these communities um, can thrive. So I'm gonna close with that. I'm going to stop sharing um, at this point um, so that perhaps we can have a few questions. Let me just say thank you so much for this really incredible talk, Fernando. This was fa fabulous. And let me also take this moment to, uh, on behalf of the hundreds of thousands of users of tools like IPython, for however little credit you want to take for it, we are all incredibly happy that your career path has become what it was because we're so, you know, our own work is so enriched by all these uh, open software tools. Thank you, Andrew. Um, that is very, very kind. And it's been, it's been hugely rewarding. It was not clear that it was going to work out. And there were some dark moments in that process. Um, and indeed, at the beginning, it, it wasn't supported. So it's very rewarding to see, to see these results, to see that what we do can help others, that it can be uh, a small, that it can make a small contribution to the work of others. Um, and that gradually the tide is changing and more and more there's a recognition that this is how science should be done. I agree. Let me take them another moment to a remind anybody listening, if you have questions, please type them in the Q and A and we will feed those to Fernando so he can answer them. And also just a quick uh, pointer that Raul is uh, and, and the Reyes company have organized a Python uh, a workshop starting this Friday. So if you wanted to get some more hands-on education with Python, you know, look how to sign up and let me just start with the first question. So the first question was, why did you uh, take physics for undergrad and how did you choose physics, especially at that time when it's so unclear what vision you might have to do with your future? Uh, great question. I was actually, I started my career as a, in Colombia as an engineering major, a double E major. Um, and what happened was uh, the school that I was attending was very heavy on physics and math in the first couple of years. And I found myself on uh, at the end of my second year, realizing that I was very sad because the physics and the math was about to be over. And we were really beginning to take a bunch of electronics classes. And at one point I realized, wait a minute, I'm the one who's wrong here. My classmates were delighted to be done with all of this linear algebra and calculus and physics. They're right, they're, they're studying to be engineers and they're about to really get into engineering. And if I'm missing all of that, I should go to a place where they teach that. Um, I do credit a lot um, that, uh, that, that video series of Cosmos, that documentary series by Carl Sagan was hugely influential um, in, my, in my teenage years and showing me um, the discovery of science and the unifying elegance of physics uh, as, a, as a beautiful way of looking at the world. Uh, now, the question is today with such a weird career path, um, was that interest justified and do I have any regrets? And I don't have any, I've had a very weird career path indeed. But I think physics is a wonderful discipline that combines theoretical rigor, mathematical foundations, and, but also a very practical and hands-on way of looking at the world. In physics, we use theory, we use mathematics, we use computing, but we use them to, to build things that have to work in the real world. Our models have to meet the reality, the harsh reality of, of nature, right? And that mix of theoretical depth, technical sophistication, and practicality, um, I think is wonderful. Uh, and it's wonderful for two reasons. First, because it gives you a lens to think about the world. I still, I'm, I may not be doing these days as much physics research, though I am actually coming back with some of our um, geoscience and climate work. I'm coming back to more physics uh, these days, but I'm certainly not doing QCD or field theory. But those principles still help me organize my thinking about the world and about the systems that I work on. Um, and they give me a very good um, sort of playbook of nature is how I think of it. I have a sense of how the world is put together. And that gives me a very good ground wire to think about many, many problems because I have a sense of what the fundamental, I mean, there's fundamental principles of nature that regardless of anything else that's happening at higher levels, you, you just don't argue with. You can't argue with conservation of energy. You can't argue with the laws of gravity. And understanding how those building blocks work together is a great foundation for a lot of other things that come later in your career and in your interest. So I still find physics to be a wonderful uh, starting point for many, many careers, regardless of whether you do end up 
being a physicist as it as uh, as it may be someone like andre or raul whose everyday research is in physics so i hope that answers the question let's go to question two uh from tomas i'm sure i'm not pronouncing your name quite right but the question is how does sharing your jupyter notebook with others work and do you need a server to let the shared notebooks run on for sure. So that's a great question, Tomas. Thank you. Um, sharing Jupyter Notebooks, there's a variety of ways. It depends on exactly what we mean by sharing notebooks. So you can share uh, the first resource that I would, uh, that I would offer. So they, we're going to go sort of in three levels. Uh, so the first one is called NB Viewer. So let me type here. Um, um, and the second one... So NB Viewer, and those links are going to show up in a second. I think I have to basically compose the whole answer and send it in one shot. Um, let me see if I can quickly find the, the right link for the third thing that I want to show. Yes, this is it. Um, so this is a little example. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you an answer in three parts because it's a very good question. So I put, um, I put a link there to, I put three links. And so I wanna explain what those three links are. The first one is called NB Viewer. And NB Viewer, let me perhaps share a screen for just a second right here. Um, so the first link to NB Viewer is this. So NB Viewer is a simple way to share Jupyter Notebooks where you put either a link to a notebook or a link to a GitHub repository that has notebooks in them. Um, let's just click on one of these as an example. And this is what you get. You get a, a rendered version of that notebook along with the fact that you can actually navigate. If it's a repo on GitHub, you can navigate the whole repo and you can view other notebooks. And it renders very quickly and they render fully and so that you can show someone a rendered version of the notebook. They can't run anything. They could download it by clicking here, but at least they can view it. And so it's a handy way without having to do anything. As long as it's a notebook that's somewhere online, it doesn't have to be on GitHub, just anywhere on the internet. Um, you can give them a link and then you share this link, uh, the NB Viewer link, and they can view it. And it, is, it, 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 it made it much easier for people to share notebooks early on. Now, the second version is this. This is called a binder. This is that link that I gave you here from uh, from the um, from the LIGO uh, the LIGO uh, that early LIGO example that I posted. Let's uh, go to it real quick uh, right here. This LIGO example right here uh, takes us precisely uh, precisely to one of these binder links. And so, what is binder? Binder lets you put down the name of a GitHub repository. And as long as that repository explicitly says, these are the libraries that are needed to run this code, Binder automatically collects those dependencies, collects the repository, clones everything, puts it in a Docker container, which is like a little bundle of code and deploys it in the cloud. And this is what it looks like. And here I am, if you look at the URL, I am in that Binder link. And all I have to do is begin hitting Shift Enter. And I am actually running, I am actually running the code for loading. And here I am, let's look, that's the first figure. This plot just happened right now on a Jupyter notebook that's running against the real LIGO data. And I didn't have to install anything because this is running a Docker container with that repository with those dependencies in the cloud. And we do have some great tutorials and I'm happy to give more resources later of examples on of how all of this can be used. So this is the second one. And then the third is this example uh, of, and you can go here, this is the third link that I posted. It is a binder link. It's a GitHub repository with a binder link for the real-time collaborative editing capabilities of, uh, of Jupyter Lab. So Jupyter Lab is our modern user interface for notebooks, and it includes real-time Google Docs style editing. And so if I click on that link and I click on the binder, the link that I put on, on the chat, and I click on the binder button, it will take me here. And this is a version of Jupyter Lab that actually has live real-time editing. This is very, very new but it's coming on, it's coming rapidly and it will let you share with others 
as long as you have the right hosting for, for your notebooks, it will let you share with others notebooks that you can co-edit live. And this obviously, as you can imagine, is very valuable both for scientific collaborations and for, and for teaching. So this particular notebook right here that will uh, open up in a second has live real-time uh, real editing. Um, there's a little demo notebook. I, we might get away with some of you hopping in here. Let's try this. Uh, let me here. So I'm going to put in the in the as a, as part of the answer to that. That link that I put should be a link to my to this exact version that's running live. This is completely an experiment, um, but I I would like somebody to try logging into that, and if they if they click on that link. What have, can they see a window like mine? Can they open demo.ipynb and begin typing uh, in a cell? Basically you can type one plus two and hit shift enter and you should see three, import this, should give you this. And you should be able to type if anyone opened that. I don't know if this is gonna work or not. This is super early, super alpha. It hasn't been fully released yet, but this, there you go. Somebody just dropped in. Hello, print your name. Hello, what is your name? There you go, people, Tomas is there. So we have real real live editing, shared execution. You can run code, you can plot things, et cetera, et cetera. So there you have it. Um, so those are kind of the three levels, right? You can share view only versions. You can share executable copies with, with NB Viewer. You can share view links. With Binder, you can share executable copies. And with this machinery, which is brand new, you'll be able to share real live collaboration. So, and I'm glad the demo worked. This was totally, totally like by the seat of my pants, let's see what happens, but it worked. Great question. Okay. So your talk is too popular, unfortunately, as in, in in four and a half minutes, the next session is starting. So just everybody know you should go to the engineering channel for the next session. Uh, for those of you who want to linger until the very end, I'll just say there's quite a few questions uh, uh, that are related or very similar, and I'll just I'll pull one of them from Danielle Yara, Jara, uh, who's asking, is someone who is maybe less experienced in uh, uh, data science and you don't have a deep programming background, what would you recommend for someone to what tools to go learn how to use these uh, Python and other scientific computing tools? So I think the, the, there's a lot of material for new interested scientists. I do want to flag. Um, so Project Pythia is a new, newly funded project from the National Science Foundation that is developing, that is going to develop um, sort of a collection, especially for people interested in the geosciences um, th that is developing uh, uh, resources um, precisely for geoscientists interested in orienting themselves. Because the only issue is, I mean, there is a lot. There's a lot of online materials. And, and these days, sometimes the, the problem is more, where do I start? Um, and so... Project Pythia is a project that is trying to solve that problem of where do I start for uh, for uh, new new coming Earth scientists and our project Jupiter meets the Earth. We are adding actually some explanatory links. So I just put um, I just put the the link to our the 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 homepage for the project and we just ran a workshop which is aimed kind of at answering this question and we're going to upload. Um, longer versions of these videos over the next couple of weeks, precisely so that someone like Danielle can perhaps find a useful starting point. Um, and from there, launch on to kind of the bigger Google waters. Because the problem right now, honestly, is that there's kind of too much on Google. Um, but as a starting point, the other, the other one that I, would, uh, that I would say is check out, if you're not too experienced with this, check out Data8. Uh, Data8.org. Uh, where's that question? Uh, Danielle, Danielle, Danielle. It might have uh, gone to the answer. So. Yep, it went to the answer. So that I ate, our data eight course is actually not a bad place to start because it's it's very introductory, but it actually gets you going with real world data examples, and it's all set up for your own. It's all open source, and it's all set up for your own um, uses. And the videos are available. Sort of the whole the whole course is available online. So it's a pretty good it's a pretty good starting point. Uh, I don't know if I'll take a look to see if there's one last question. 
that I can answer in one minute because I know I don't want to cut into the time of the next. Uh, one person said, would you recommend a computer science and physics double major? And I think you'd say yes. Yeah, if you, and especially if you really like if you really like the computing side of things, absolutely. They, they make for a wonderful combination. So if you're interested in the computing, yes. Um, how will Jupiter help solve the climate change problem? Uh, I don't know that it will help solve it, but at least I do hope that giving scientists better tools to analyze this much data, collaborate on the data. The example that I showed over the Pangeo Gallery, right, um, is um, shows how with these tools, certain kinds of analysis that used that used to be very very engineering heavy.